Hello and welcome to the last event in the academic year of our Poetry and Poetics series at the English Department of Maynooth University, Ireland. My name is Catherine Gander and I and my colleague Carlo Hanlon are the organisers of the series, which we are very happy to confirm will be continuing next academic year. Over the last nine months, we have been honoured to have been joined by Carolyn Forche, Philip Metris, Aishan Hutchinson, Vani Capildale, and now it gives us great pleasure to welcome Sean Hewitt. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our Head of Department, Professor Lauren Arrington, for her support of the series, and Tracy O'Flaherty for all her assistance in running the series behind the scenes. Thank you. You will find recordings of our events on the Maynooth English YouTube channel. Do also follow us on uh, Eventbrite to keep informed of future events. Today we'll hear Sean Hewitt read from his wonderful debut collection, Tongues of Fire, as well as from some new work, so lucky us, followed by a conversation between myself, Carl and Sean. Please feel free to ask a question of Sean in the chat box in the second half of this event and either Carl or I will put that question to Sean. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can. The event will last one hour and it is being recorded. Sean Hewitt was born in 1990. He is a book critic for the Irish Times and he teaches modern British and Irish literature at Trinity College Dublin. He won a Northern Writers Award in 2016, the Resurgence Prize in 2017, which I think is the, the Ginkgo Eco Poetry Prize now, and an e uh, Eric Gregory Award in 2019. In 2020, he was chosen by the Sunday Times as one of their 30 under 30 most promising artists in Ireland. His exceptional debut poetry collection, Tongues of Fire, was published by Jonathan Cape in 2020. Sean was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award that same year. He was also nominated for the John Pollard Foundation International Poetry Prize and a Dolkey Literary Award in 2021. His scholarly book, J. M. Singh, Nature, Politics, Modernism has recently been published with Oxford University Press. Congratulations, Sean. And his memoir, All Down Darkness Wide, is forthcoming from Jonathan Cape in the UK and Penguin Press in the USA in 2022. From May until September this year, Sean will be the Irish Queer Archive Poet in Residence, a position that is funded by the Arts Council Ireland in partnership with Court Festival and the National Library of Ireland. Sean's debut collection, Tongues of Fire, has deservedly been met with widespread superlative praise. The Guardian called it inspirational and uplifting, vertiginous and dreamlike. The Sunday Times celebrated it as already taking its place in a pantheon of timeless poetic works. Max Porter in the Irish Times' best books of 2020 called Sean an exquisitely calm and insightful lyric poet, reverential in nature and gorgeously wise in the field of human drama. I could go on, but you get the idea. I've been looking forward to this event for the best part of a year. When I first read Tongues of Fire, I was both taken aback and drawn in by its exquisite lyricism, its luminous grace. Opening the pages of this book is like entering those woods that Robert Frost famously stopped in front of. These poems will take you to places lovely, dark and deep. Each poem in the collection offers its own profound meditation on the gifts, both beautiful and brutal, of the world. As such, they evoke curiosity, trepidation, excitement, love. There's a kind of, a kind of ecstatic aura about this book that hangs between the poems like mist between the trees. That feeling both roots us to the natural world and to our most basic human desires, at the same time as elevating us beyond ourselves, toward others, human and non-human, natural and supernatural, and toward a kind of connective understanding. Sean Hewitt's work might, 
rightly draw comparisons with Jared Manley Hopkins, Seamus Heaney and Alice Oswald, but his voice is all his own. In short, Tongues of Fire is a magnificent book, a gift, and Sean Hewitt is a rare talent. Sean, a huge welcome from Carl and myself and all at Manus, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, Carl, Catherine and Manuth for inviting me. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can uh, read the poems uh, as I read them. Um, so if you bear with me, you'd think I'd be better at this by now. So I think theoretically you should all be able to see this now. Um, I'm going to start off with a poem um, that features Gerard Manley Hopkins, actually. Um, so it was nice to have uh, him mentioned there in Catherine's introduction. Um, Hopkins has always been a really magnetic character for me, uh, not only in his poems, but in his personal life and in his diaries too. Um, and it was his attention to the strange things in the natural world that uh, struck me. Um, and I found a passage in one of his diaries where uh, he noted going out uh, in the morning to uh, the urinals uh, outside uh, the priest's training center he was at. Uh, and he noted how the frost um, had, had spread across uh, the urinals there. Um, so that's the quoted line in this poem. Uh, which is called Vestige. A sash window blooming with frost. December morning, and ferns of it unfurling upward. White feathers of ice, the ghost of a wing on the glass. From the bed, under heavy linen, we watched how slowly the structures of water unend themselves. Now, across the field, I see you crouching in rapture by the slate urinals, frosted in graceful sprays. Night, it seems, has fingered each effusion into a tree of white crystal. I hear your cry, leap, then echo. Inside me, the water branches. The world rings like a glass, and my body rings in the world like a glass. Tongues of Fire has uh, a couple of longer poems in it, uh, the title poem, which comes towards the end. Um, but I thought I'd start off uh, just by reading one long poem, which is uh, the first long poem in the book. I don't think it needs any um, explanatory notes to it. Um, so I'll just go ahead and read it. It's called Dryad. Um, or perhaps I should say, uh, Dryad is uh, a dryad uh, as, I'm sure you know, is uh, a sort of tree spirit, usually uh, an oak spirit or, or a guardian uh, of an oak. Um, and this is based on a, on a, on a real carved um, carving of a, of a woman in the village where I grew up. Um, and she's wearing a cloak and she has this um, ball in her hands. Dryad. I remember her covered in snow, in a field where each dead stalk of wild flower was thick with frost. The sky was pink in the hawthorns, the day held on the light edge of breaking. A woman carved from the bowl of an oak, her feet, if she had any, buried in the winter's shedding weight. Whoever had turned her from the tree had given her an orb, which she held in both hands, close to the gentle curve of her face. 
and she stood there by the half-rotten stile of Broad Lane, head bowed, as though waiting to greet us and offer the frozen circumference of a new world. Years ago, our school had planted the woods behind her when I was eight or nine, and now each tree ages alongside us. Every time I go back, I see a part of my life laid out, still growing in a field by the old village. And I used to come here often, at 18 or so, with men at night. And it was strange to pass her as we stumbled in the undergrowth and into the woods like deer plummeting through the wet branches. And I think now of all the men forced outside after clearing out into the dark spaces of towns, how they walk in vigil to woodlands and old estates, to the smell of the day settling. Once, I came here with a man whose whole body was muscled, as though he too had been carved from a single trunk of wood. I pretended all the time to be a man like him, answering each lie in a deep alien voice. I think I was afraid he would kill me and walked a few steps ahead, hearing him moving through the sodden grass pulling his feet from the bramble vines. We passed the woman without comment, though she stood there in her cloak of wood, the globe held in the lathe green of her hands. Here was so unlike the places other people went, a place without doors or walls or rooms. The black, heavy leafed branches pulled back like a curtain and inside a dark chamber of the wood guarded and made safe. The bed was the bed of all the plants and trees and we could share it. And then the kneeling down in front of him, keeping my secrets still in the folds of night, trying not to shake in the cold and the damp floor seeping up. I remember the cold water spreading in the capillaries of my jeans. As I looked up, the sky hidden under a rain of leaves, each tree stood over me in perfect symmetry with his body. Each was like a man with his head bent, each watching, and moving and making slow, laboured sighs. I came back often, year on year, kneeling and being knelt for in acts of secret worship. And now each woodland smells quietly of sex, not only when the air is thick with it, but in winter too, when the strains are grounded and held against the earth. And each time I half expect to meet someone among the trees or inside the empty skeleton of the rhododendron. And I wonder if I have ruined these places for myself, if I have brought each secret to them and weighed the trees with things I can no longer bear. But then what is a tree or a plant, if not an act of kneeling to the earth? a way of bidding the water to move, of taking in the mouth the inner part of the world and coaxing it out. Not just the aching leaf buds in spring, the cloud of pollen, or in autumn the children knocking branches for the shower of seed, but the people who kneel in the woods at night the woman waiting by the gate, offering to each visitor a small portion of the world in which they might work for the life of it.
this poem is in three parts. Each is a sonnet of sorts. Um, I was thinking, and this is something I've been thinking about uh, a bit more in writing um, that memoir that Catherine uh, kindly mentioned, um, about a sort of uh, spectral lineage of queerness uh, that um, I think the more uh, we join a community after after coming out, uh, we realise that we have um, all been acting along similar lines in certain ways and thinking similar things. Um, and there's a sort of uh, inheritance, I think, that happens uh, that's not a blood inheritance, um, but is perhaps an inherited um, reaction uh, to similar conditions. Um, and one of the reactions, uh, the worst form of reaction uh, to these conditions is, is suicide and, and um, difficult mental health problems that, that queer people um, very disproportionately experience in, in youth and in later life too. Um, and this is a poem that kind of attempts to draw together some of those ideas. Uh, it's called Ghost. One. Waking, close to morning, but still a shuttered metal dark in the room. A sound inside my dream, only a whimper at first, then becoming human. A howl raised in the street outside, left unanswered, then raised again. In my boxes, shivering by the single paned window, but seeing no one among the black shapes of the parked cars or hedges. I went out half-dressed, hands shaking, front door unlocked, then pushed open. And by the column of the porch, under a cone of orange light, a young man slumped, drunk sobbing like his whole life was unfurling into sound. Two. And now I am rem reminded of one afternoon, home from school, my father digging out the root of a conifer in the garden. I saw him look up, suddenly alert, leave by the back gate into the alley behind the terraces and return panicked with a boy in his arms. I recognized him about my age from school by his dreadlocks, his turquoise streak of hair, but now lolling under his own weight, his wrists draining over my father's muddied jeans and the patio tiles. I knew, even then, the rumours about him, thought as we wrapped and pinned torn sheets around his opened veins, how we might share, once the truth was out, a bond, an elective blood. Three. Nights later, I only half slept, expecting at any moment to hear someone again outside, as though time might be caught in a loop, the same boy walking the mapped route along the dark streets at the same hour to my door. Again, I unshuttered the window, stood waiting to see him come, barefoot, maybe, down the path. Each night, no sign, until I thought perhaps it was only me or a dream of myself, asking nightly to be greeted at the threshold, allowed back into the cold room of my life. But then in each of us, a wound must be made or given. There is always the soul waiting at the door of the body asking to be let out.
I don't know if this is a Dublin thing, but um, my hay fever is through the roof um, right now. Uh, I'm on two, two Loretta in a day. You're only supposed to take one. I don't know if the second one helps, but it helps me mentally to feel like I'm doing something proactive about it. Um, so I thought I'd read a pollen poem. Um, although this one actually comes from, from Manhattan. Uh, I was over in New York uh, one year and I um, was walking along to the New York Public Library and uh, caught a smell that I recognized um, well. Uh, and you'll, you'll find out what the, uh, what the smell was, a certain bodily smell. Uh, this is called calorie pear. Calorie pears are the names of the trees, I should say. All of a sudden, it stops me. Acrid and sour white, wafting in sheets as the pollen catches the sun, then billows upwards. The same smell, loosing now in drifts through the hot streets, and then as I breathe, clenching deep under my sacrum, a fist of longing, call of silvered nights when I would make my body burst its bloom, then snug down, half sweated, the stain of myself, smelling almost of another man, held like blossom to my nose. The second, Tongs of Fire is in four parts, and the second part is uh, a translation of sorts um, from the Middle Irish tale, Gwila um, which follows uh, Sweeney, a character who I call Sivna, I just didn't translate any of the names, um, who is cursed uh, and set out to wander um, outdoors, um, He's sort of banished and he goes a bit mad. Um, and I say that these are part translations uh, because often it's just a line or two of the original poem that uh, I use to begin a poem of my own. Um, some of the poems uh, in my sequence are a lot closer um, to the original uh, and some of them are entirely invented. Or, or borrow ideas uh, and riff off them in that way. Um, so I took quite a lot of license with these poems. Uh, I think looking back, um, they came at a time of, of me having a little bit of writer's block. Um, and I think if I were to psychoanalyze myself, I think they're a sort of breakup poem um, rooted back through, uh, through, island in the in the ninth tenth centuries um so i thought i'd read you a couple of these um the first one is called sivna in the glen and this is this is the first poem after swivna was cursed he wandered island for weeks searching in the cavities of rocks and roots climbing the ivy strung trees and peering over the canopies until he found Glen Balkan. This was where all the madmen came. Here, the little wood was dotted with sturdy wells and clear sand flank streams covered in watercress and the brook line leaning over. The wood was full of oaks, wood sorrels, garlic, blackthorns and trees whose names were lost between the lips of men. Naked, Sivna walked its soft paths and slept high in a hawthorn on the glen slope. At night, each twist and turn of his dream would set the thorns into his body, and soon his limbs were cut and swollen. After that, he chose another place, a thicket of bramble where the thorns were finer, and a single white blossomed arm of black thorn sheltered the plants from the rain. Even though his body was frail, with his white skin stretched tight over the ribs and his collarbones sticking out, the little black thorn gave way one night 
under his weight. He thought, it is hard to live without a home. It is hard to be a whole year under the gloom of branches. It is hard to be without the sound of children or music or the voices of women. And it is cold, cold for me now since my body has lived outside much rain has fallen upon it and much thunder now just read one more of these poems um which comes towards the end of the sequence and it's when uh Sivna is uh wounded with a spear in his side and he makes a, a confession he's lived away from um from his wife uh, for a long time uh, because he's been banished um, and he doesn't actually, he doesn't get to see her again. Uh, this is Sivna is wounded and confesses. There was a time when I thought the sound of a dove cooing and flitting over a pond was sweeter than the voices of friends. There was a time when I preferred the blackbird and the boom of a stag belling in a storm. I used to think that the chanting of the mountain grouse at dawn had more music than your voice, but things are different now. Still, it would be hard to say I wouldn't rather live above the bright lake and eat watercrats in the wood and be away from sorrow. So I promised um, that I would read a couple of new poems, which always makes me slightly nervous um, uh, because I feel like I need some sort of approval uh, from an editor or a publisher before I, I can trust that they are done or um, not total embarrassments. Um, this poem was written um, probably about this time last year, actually a little bit earlier. Um, I was lucky enough to spend um, a month in the Lake District um, in, a, in a cottage that um, some very kind people lent to me. Um, and I don't think there's anything you need to know about this poem, apart from that first line, the uh, Hunterways are a sort of uh, sheepdog uh, that they were trialing out uh, in the Lake District. Um, instead of running around uh, to herd the sheep, they bark. Um, but the problem is that you can't stop them from barking. So all the way through the night, uh, they bark. Uh, and I just happen to be living next to uh, a farm with a lot of them, uh, a lot of them barking all the way through the night. Um, so this is Sleepwalk, and it comes with an epigraph from the Psalms. Sleepwalk. Loved one and friend hast thou put far from me, and mine acquaintance into darkness. Not the bark of the hunterways, nor how they built the tower of sound, nor the stream, nor its rearrangement, not the shadow of the fell, nor the oil of the night across it. Not the hollow, nor the owls, though these know it. Not the clank of the gate, nor the stones, nor the hand of the water taking mine. As when the shapes of the hills hold, give way, are gone. As when the fog lowers its loss along the banks, along the ridges, as when the stone walls pour white like mouths discharging, as when a candle shone upon my head where I walked, nor how I touch the rose hips, first with my torch, now my hand, here then here, puckered with the body of their flower, nor the hazel contracted at night to its brocade, which I lift, nor its catkins hanging silver, nor the fog 
only its movement, its ghost, as through a rude screen, its breathing, nor the wicks, nor the fires in the branches, lovely, monastic, nor how I stepped through the mist about me, having no body, nor hands held aloft, a curtain, shattered water, deeper, seeking, knowing that you are waiting at the heart. I just finished with one uh, poem, uh, which doesn't need much explanation, apart from that ghost moths are a real thing. Um, they are moths that um, are white on one side and, and um, dark on the other, so when they fly, they kind of look like they vanish um, and, the, and then reappear. Evening with ghost moths. I'd just like to say thank you all for listening to me. Evening with ghost moths. The field damp. My father, six weeks gone to the day. And then these frail glimmering flecks turning in the seed heads of the long grass. The shape of sycamore keys tumbling turned spirit, flights of white flicking quickly and the underwing dark, so a flash of light and then nothing, gone, then again a shimmering, a dance, the veil of the world shook, glinting, split second, each moth, a door spinning open, then shut. What apertures are these? Into which hole in the night are they vanishing? Little spectres, each body a fitful apparition undoing its sign on the dark, so that for longer than I know, I am held like a child, my darting eyes waiting for you Father, to turn your white side open, to show yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, uh, for that wonderful reading and uh, those small portions of the world that you hold in, in each of those poems. And we're particularly grateful for, for that uh, first stirring of those last poems, so thank you. Uh, uh, please do feel free to drop your questions into the chat, but I might, if I, I may, just launch with, with a first question. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in your poetry is this uh, thisness of your poems, that phrase from Don Scotus, the, the Scottish philosopher, uh, much admired by Hopkins. And that idea of, of, of a thisness, the objective reality of a thing, mm. uh, and that poem vestige that pays homage to Hopkins it, with the pattern of frost on the urinals, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of a phrase in one of Hopkins' journals, a lot very close by, I think, uh, where he says, what you look at hard seems to look at you. Mm. So a lot of poems in the past 10 years have played with perspective, uh, telling the truth slant, a kind of postmodern irony and parallax. Uh, and I wonder if your poems seem to be taking a slightly different stance, one that in a way wants to root us in the essential reality of the world, mm -hmm. albeit one that pays homage or protects the privacy of the specific, of the individual. So I wonder, is that a, a description of your poetry? Is it in this kind of post postmodern phase, if that's not too crude a way of, of putting it? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair thing to say. I mean, when I first started writing poetry, I suppose it was around 2010, 2012. Um, and, and what I was aware of uh, as uh, the poetry of, of people, I suppose they would now be perhaps my contemporaries, but five or six years older than me that were publishing their first collections was, was a, a, a great irony uh, and, and play uh, 
a sense of popular culture being brought in and, and uh, this kind of distance of people like uh, Sam Rivier or something like that. You know, those, those are the big books when I started writing and um, I, I, that's just not me. I'm not, I'm not that sort of person. Uh, so I suppose in a simple answer, uh, there's a temperamental difference between, uh, between me and, and that sort of writing. But I think what I find really interesting about Hopkins and, and your question about thisness is that I think Hopkins has this idea of, of stress and in stress and the stress of, uh, that holds things together. Um, a sort of pattern of energy that holds things together and and the reason that I think is that he is obsessed with the thisness of stuff and and I think I am too is that he says at one point that there's there's a stress in things that that bears us over uh, that bears us out and carries the mind over I think he says um so I think there's a way that I'm thinking about the thisness of things as a sort of uh, way of transpositioning the mind into, into another object and asking questions in another way through that object. So it gives me a sense of, of being able to, um, uh, I suppose the question that, that I might have in, in a poem like Tongues of Fire, for example, which I, I didn't read is, is how might I look at this situation where I, a fungus, you know, which which is kind of acknowledging that the reality of that thing, but then also asking like, what questions does a fungus ask of the world that I'm not asking because I'm not a, a fungus? You know, like what are these new ways of knowing that 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 transposition of a symbol might might allow me to to think through? Um, so, what questions might it have for a relationship to? the air for example or, or to or to water or you know like these things use it differently they, they give you a different sense of, of perspective in the world and, and that's why i find them really useful to think through uh, and with so yes it's a material reality um but it's also my kind of trick uh sense of trying to get my mind outside of outside of itself and into into something else which i find a really useful way of kind of starting a poem or, or, or a useful engine to, to drive a poem uh, to allow me to think. I suppose that is a slant thought. It's, it's a way of moving the, the mind outside yourself, mm -hmm. filtering it back to you, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Sean. I can see some questions coming in here. If you do have a question, just pop it in the chat rather than raising your hand. Um, and we have a couple of questions, one from Chris and one from Marion. I absolutely promise that we will get to those. I just wanted to tack something onto Carl's question there about the kind of aesthetics of attention that we were kind of skirting around thinking about there. Um, and, you know, I mean, it has obviously been said before that, he, or remarked upon before, the kind of reverence um, of, of your book and the attention that your poems pay, especially to the details of the, of the natural world, is really exquisite. And it does make me think of a line from Simone Weil that is often in my head, um, which is, you know, attention taken to its highest degree is the same thing as prayer. It presupposes faith and love. Um, and so, you know, we could read Tongues of Fire as a kind of prayer book in this way. And, you know, like the title is the name of, you know, of, of the rust fungus, right? That grows on the juniper tree. But of course, it's also a kind of holy or holy reaching speech. Um, you know, the Tongues of Fire feature in the Bible to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through the human. Um, and then that just kind of got me thinking about what prayers are, how they're kind of given and received, how they're kind of offerings of thanks, but also kind of quite often desperate messages of hope. Um, and I see this in, in your poems. When I started reading them again, I was kind of underlining all of those words um, that carried a lot of weight. Literally, you know, the word weight is, is, is scattered throughout at least the first poems quite a lot. Um, but counterbalanced by these beautiful images of, of, of levity and lightness, um, so you've got this kind of movement between grief and ecstasy. And I was just wondering if you could say just a bit to us before we move into the questions from Chris, etc., cetera, um, about how these kind of ideas of prayer uh, and reverence might resonate with you when you think about or when you write poetry. Yeah, I, I, I love that 
that quote. Uh, I think it's true. Um, attention is a, is a really uh, useful way of starting a poem. I think uh, it's always the place where I start uh, is to to describe something as 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 well as I can in detail and see what emerges from from that physical thing. Um, I think also the process of writing a poem for me is akin to something that we might call prayer. I suppose I think of prayer as a sort of human instinct that was then given a name later, you know, by by religion. It's probably something that uh, we tend to do anyway. It's the, petition um, something outside ourselves for, for a sort of uh, meaning or help uh, with, with understanding. Uh, and I think a poem, or as at, at least how I see a poem, is that it might be a series of questions unanswered, uh, or it might be uh, a reaching for the best question um, or the best framing of a question that gets towards what you don't know. And it's not necessarily that you're ever going to find get to the answer, but that you might get further and further closer towards it through through questioning. Um, and so I think in that way, it, it is kind of a prayerful process. Um, and I think as well, you know, in order to write a poem, I have to, um, you know, I could I could write one in a busy room of people. Mm. So it so it kind of requires you to have this sort of. Uh, attentive space um, in in your thinking so that probably comes through in, in the in the tenor of the poem that you write uh, or the poem that, that I write anyway uh, tends to be I suppose meditative in a, yeah in a, in a way. yeah yeah well I wanted to ask you about your process um, perhaps a little bit later on but I can see some questions in the chat so I'll let Carl read the first one there thanks Catherine so uh, Chris Lloyd asks, uh, says, thanks, Sean. Can you say a little bit about how you see the queerness of your poems, either in terms of content or form? Is there a queer aesthetic you think you're developing or do you see the poems as something else? Mm. Thanks, Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, I suppose, you know, in, in some ways, I don't know if this is most poets or just me, but um, I tend not to do things consciously and then I pretend that I've done them consciously afterwards um, to make it look like I had a project in mind. Um, but so I, I was never really consciously thinking of writing a, a book that developed a queer aesthetic or, you know, I, di I didn't start off uh, with this idea. But I suppose one thing that I did consciously do is attempt to marry or, or put together the poetry of, of na you know, nature poets, uh, like Oswald, for example, who, who I love, um, and was one of my first big, big loves. Um, and then the poetry of the body, um, through people like Andrew McMillan, or Mark Doty, or Dennis Smith, like, to marry these two things together, and it eventually became a sort of queer nature poetry in that way. Um, so I think that was a, a, a consequence of a collision that was uh, deliberate. Um, I don't know, I, th I think it's a, a dangerous territory for me to, uh, to, to articulate what, what I'm trying to do aesthetically um, and not just let myself do it because the, the worry I think is um, that I will consciously try to do something and the second I do that I, I will probably begin to fail at it. Um, so, yes and no, Chris. Um, yes, I think there is a queer aesthetic at play. Um, could I name it? Probably not. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for that question, Chris. Um, nice to see you <laughs> again virtually. Our paws keep crossing virtually. Um, okay, I have a question from Marion Coy. Um, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly there, Marion. What poets do you see as your ghost moths? The apertures that allowed you in? <laughs> That's a nice way of framing That's that a, question. A lovely question. Um, the poets who allowed me in. Um, I would say Mark Doty is probably up there as one of the, the poets who, who allowed me in, who, who, who gave me a uh, a sense of what poetry 
could do. Um, uh, uh, not just a, a queer poetry, but poetry in, in general. Um, I, I love his poems, the musicality of them. Um, his three line stanzas are something I have stolen. Uh, <laughs> and um, and I think, yeah, I, I, I think he's perfect. Uh, I, I, I would happily read him um, forever. I think he's very wise. Um, other poets who have allowed me in, Alice Oswald was someone I, I, I tried um, very hard to be like uh, to begin with. Uh, I, I found the way that she uh, wrote um, images and sound down on paper um, to be kind of revelatory, really. I, I, I couldn't really overstate how, how, how that kind of rewired what I thought poetry might might be. Um, and then more recently, uh, Carl Phillips, uh, who's an American poet, I don't know if he's even published over here, but um, in, in, those, in those newer poems, I mean, you probably wouldn't see that Carl Phillips was behind them, but um, often it's just a, a turn of phrase or a way of, of approaching a, a poem that he has um, that gave me a sense of oh I can come at it this way or I can I can um he has a sort of baroque language at times uh, that I really like uh, and admire and, and sometimes it's just yeah uh scraps of music or, or words or stuff that allow you in um and it doesn't necessarily I don't think have to be one poet, sometimes it's a poem or a line from any poet that, that seems to to click as a little window or aperture for me. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sean. I think there's, some, there's something quite musical about those tercets as well, They're kind of a musical triad, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and I might come back to you about the, the kind of Baroque language, because I, I, I think I want to kind of probe a little bit about influence and uh, romanticism in your work. But I, I might just take a, a question from the chat from Siobhan, uh, who writes, what, what drew you to write about the character Mad Sweeney? Uh, I know he features in Flann O'Brien's At Swim Two Birds. Is he representative of a writer who perhaps has to step outside society to observe and to write? Yeah, I, th I suppose I came across him first through, through the original text. I, I, um, probably quite precociously did a, a module in old Irish when I was at university um, and that was mainly because I went to a British state school and the other options you had to be good at either French or Spanish or something which I wasn't um, so I could take a new language. Um, I think in some ways with the Sweeney poems um, I'd never written with characters before, um, and it was quite nice as a way of freeing myself. I don't know if I think he's representative of a of an artist, but um, I come at him in a in a slightly different way than O'Brien or or Heaney. Um, Heaney Sweeney, I think, can be quite quite violent at times, and and uh, mine is kind of a sad little um, vulnerable uh, guy, and and I suppose that's just what I saw him in, or saw in him, or, or wanted to see him in him uh, while I was writing the poem. So I suppose in that way, he was just kind of a vector for, um, for what I wanted. Um, but there is something, yeah, I think just archetypally attractive about someone running off through trees. I mean, there's a, um, I've forgotten who wrote it now, but the, the Baron in the Trees, the, um, Oh, I can't remember. It's an Italian writer. Its name's gone by me now. But um, there's also a novel, uh, an Italian novel about uh, a little boy that runs off and lives up in the trees, um, which is great too. I'd really recommend it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to come back to that question about process because you were speaking uh, a little bit earlier about um, the kind of meditative quality of your poems and you know it makes me think of that kind of you know coming back to kind of uh, lineage and 
and the romanticism of your work uh, makes me think I'm sorry of Wordsworth I'm not saying that I'm, I'm drawing comparisons yeah. between you and Wordsworth I'm not um but you know I, I do think of that um what does he say the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings but it takes its origin in emotion hold on let me remember my GCSEs recollected in tranquility. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of, of, of people in the audience would be kind of interested in your process. So, um, you know, like we've, we've talked about, um, about prayer and about place. Um, and I wonder if you could talk to us about, you know, how your poems come to you. Um, are they tethered to a particular place? Uh, whether that place is imagined or real? Do they come to you when you're when you're outdoors, when you're walking, has the pandemic affected the way poems come to you? Um, and what comes first, you know, maybe an image or, or a kind of turn of phrase or a, or a line or even a word that you feel like needs to be in a poem? Mm -hmm. The pandemic has scared poems off for me. So I'm hoping that they'll come back um, once I've, um, once the summer uh, heads off. But um, I suppose poems come to me Poems have to start with me with something physical that I describe, um, and that's usually my route into a poem. So I take notes on my phone in the in the notes bit, uh, and then when I get home, I write them up in a notebook. Um, and sometimes it's just something that I see uh, that strikes me as an interesting thing to to describe, and I often continue to describe that thing until I sense that there's a meaning coming through from it. Um, I can't start a poem with an idea or an experience without having that sort of thing to to write through, uh, mm -hmm. because I think it becomes a very untethered or abstract poem if I try to, if I begin with the emotion I'm mm -hmm. writing, rather than writing out of something. So I tend to uh, describe something physical first and see what what comes out of that what mm -hmm. what does this thing remind me of or how might it be like that time when this happened or whatever um so that's where it starts um i do also keep kind of lists of words that i think are interesting um so for example a poem called lapwings in in tongues mm -hmm. of fire um, i have a i have a word document i actually then accidentally sent it when I sent it off with the drafts still attached, there was about ten pages of lapwings. Um, <laughs> but it, but one of the one of the documents was just a load of words that mm -hmm. kind of reminded me of or, or the the etymology of lap of of the different languages words for lapwings to try and think of like how they might be uh, differently. So it mm -hmm. can kind of spin out of the language too in that way. Um, so all different things, but mainly note taking, um, yeah. and I just write until until it seems to crystallize into a poem. I don't write very often, um, even right. when I was writing well, uh, which I'm not anymore. Even when I was writing, <laughs> it would have been like a, a poem every month or two would have been really good going for me. I, I'm I'm not a quick yeah. writer. Yeah. Well, what you were saying there about kind of the a sort of journeying through or, or getting from one place to another reminds me of the kind of talking of etymology, the etymology of metaphor, which is like a, a carrying over, mm -hmm. right? So you start in one place mm -hmm. and you end in another, but you couldn't have got there yeah. without the original image or, or, or thing. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. transports and transforms in its journey. Mm. Yeah, there's a, um, and now I actually don't know because I've never said her name aloud to anyone, but Mary, Rufal. Yeah, Rufal. Yeah, I don't know. I say Rufal. Um, <laughs> has, has a quote that I, I love. Um, I think she calls it a, a poem. It says something like a poem is like a hyphen or, or uh, in that it connects two things that would never have been connected if the poem wasn't there. Right, so right, um, right. Yeah. I think that's a really good way of thinking about a poem. Like mm. the poem is there to, to do that meta thing mm. to carry mm. across. Mm. Um, and you need somewhere to start. And you also need somewhere to go. And those are kind of the two main ingredients. Uh, <laughs> Even if you don't know where you're going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. I'm, I'm just kind of thinking as you write, uh, I know we're keeping an eye on, on time and I'll invite you to um, 
read a read a poem for us in a moment. But just just I'm thinking about you know so the words that that resonate with me today from from your discussion from our discussion are carrying over uh, kind of inhabiting another space, and I, I think it's th that that kind of um, reaching out that that seems so so strong in your work, uh, and I suppose I just wanted to ask. There's a kind of line of influence I see in your work from from Hopkins through those journal writings, even the kind of practice of of, of writing things down, observing writing, and I wonder is, is your poetry a kind of recovery of you know that this um, 1940s Dylan Thomas apocalypse poetry, a poetry that is baroque, that is also clued into to nature in certain ways. Um, that was in some ways killed off by by um, the movement and its sort of diminished horizons. Um, and I wonder, it brings in a, a whole load of questions that we probably don't have time for about poetry's relationship to mystery and the kind of rejection of, of a certain type of, of discursivity. Do you, do you see your poetry as inhabiting a romantic legacy uh, in that in that way? It's a really it's a really good question. Um, and you know when you're naming Dylan Thomas and people like that. I'm nodding along because, yeah, I I, I love I love those poets, and I kind of, um, you know, often I'm not really a fan of some of the stuff that goes in between. Uh, where you know, like I, we all do this bypass certain movements in our head and wish they never happened. Um, even though I, you know, I'm a a scholar of modernism, um, but it wouldn't be where I personally go to to poetry. Um, I think when I first came to poetry, and when I say this, I mean, you know, as like a four-year-old, um, I suppose I still have that instinctive um, magic of, of, oh, that's what I want to recover. That's what I want to, to, to put down on the page. It was my mom reading me The Tiger by William Blake, and just the, the, kind of bouncing rhythm of it and this kind of dark imagery and the sense of kind of threat in it or you know that atmosphere really caught me up um and i suppose to me that's kind of the perfect poem and and that's um the atmosphere of a room i think that's the thing that i i love about poetry is the, the way it might create a musical atmosphere in which things might happen um and larkin you know as a teenager, I liked Larkin, but but now I, I wouldn't turn to him um, because I don't want to give up on the idea uh, that that the poetry might do that. Um, that is really kind of important to me that uh, there might be something as unfashionable as as beauty in the world, um, and that is uh, something I, I'm quite a strong defender of uh, even if it, it might be useless uh, in some people's eyes yeah <laughs> never <laughs> listen Sean we're running out of time we have a couple of minutes left and you know that in this series we prefer to let the poet have the final word we would love it if you would read uh, a short poem to conclude the event and then I'll hand over to Carl who can just wrap things up so I just want to say thank you so thank much you. for spending this hour with us, Sean. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thanks for those questions, Carl and Catherine, and the audience questions. Um, it's been a real treat. Um, so I'm just going to read one more poem. Uh, my screen should share now. Um, this poem is called Ilex, uh, and I wrote it after the birth of, of my nephew. Uh, Ilex is the, the Latin name for uh, the holly tree family. Ilex. Distracting myself, waiting for news. I walked until I saw this white cluster of holly growing at the base of a tree. The stems yellowed, the angled clutch of leaves like a bleached coral. A pale antler, almost medieval, like a relic unearthing in the gloom of the wood. 
Later, still the baby would not latch. And I came back to this holly, unhardened by the sun, unable to turn the light into strength. May it keep its whiteness. May it never learn the use of spikes. Or in time, when a crown is made of it, may the people approach one by one to witness how a fragile thing is raised. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thanks very much for, for allowing us to witness and bear witness to these fragile things. And thank you to all of our listeners throughout the year of, of this series, to Professor Lauren Arrington, and a special thanks to Tracy O'Flaherty, who's been a wonderful uh, supporter of this series and helping our work. Uh, and thank you too to Catherine, uh, my fantastic co-host. Uh, we will be back in October for a new series of uh, Poetry and Poetics at Maynooth. And until then, look after yourselves and have a great summer. And we hope to see you soon. And thanks again, Sean. <laughs>